Place and test your microphones, and that's a very important thing. People don't don't think too much about uh, microphones or your audio, but you know, if you get great video, you don't have good audio. That's terrible, and you want to be aware. Probably, it's a good idea if you're shooting to get a little mixer board, uh, and you want to feed your mics into a small mixer board, and then you want to actually have it going into your camera. You know, you want to take it from line level to mic level using an attenuator and feed it into your camera if your camera doesn't take line level and make sure that you can get a good signal when you're listening to your headphones on your mixer board on your camera that you're getting good sound going into the camera sometimes it's good to get an external audio recorder like an agra or there's another number of different brands that you can use to record audio and then sync it back to your video and post audio mixers now Along with your television, you always have a certain amount of audio. And so uh, the audio is part of your system. If you have real good video and you don't have good audio, you, you just don't have a really usable product and vice versa. And lots of people that are videographers tend to ignore the audio. And, and so they have all this beautiful video and then they have audio that's absolutely terrible. And there's lots of mistakes people make from an engineering standpoint where your audio is, is really bad. And so one thing you have to realize is, you know, if you're if you're actually doing like like I am now, I've got a uh, a dynamic microphone on a on a pedestal here, and that's working pretty good for me. But if I was in a group setting and there was a lot more ambient noise, I would consider using a lavalier mic. Uh, and so that's one thing to consider. And you have all these different mics, like you have a dynamic mic which doesn't require any batteries, and you have condenser mics that require batteries for them to work and usually that battery battery is an integral part of your of your microphone but in in studio production situations what you have is something called phantom power which is a 45 volt source or thereabouts that drives your microphone so it has power to work and so in most situations like that you're actually getting power from your audio mixer board now audio mixer boards come in all different shapes and sizes, but basically the function of an audio mixer board is to take inputs from many microphones, at least two or three or four, and other audio sources like CD roll-in, remote feeds that we're getting off of a transmission, a telos signal off a telos device to be feeding a telephone information in, and there's a numerous amount of audio signals that can be fed into an audio mixer. And audio mixers are usually defined by the number of channels they have. You could have like a, you could have an eight channel audio mixer, which would be really good for uh, small remote shoots. And then you could have a 12 channel and you go up to 24 channel and 36 channel and so forth. And this determines the size of the number of inputs that you could have going into your audio mixer. However, there's a lot more to an audio mixer than just the channel ends. When you look at an audio mixer, especially, you, you also have to determine what the function of the mixer is. And there's two basic categories of function for an audio mixer. One category is for reinforcement. The other cat category is for production. A reinforcement audio mixer is designed to reinforce the signals of the audio in a room like you're in a PA situation and you have a large room like an auditorium or a symphony hall or some place where you need the audio reinforced and so a reinforcement mixer is designed to work in a situation where you have a lot of people in a big room and of course the people in the back can't hear without uh, speakers mounted around them or somewhere in the room to reinforce what the person is saying you know whoever's talking or the music or whatever that's a reinforcement mixer the other mixer would be a production mixer. You have a production mixer that would be used in a recording studio. It has a, one set of characteristics. You have a production mixer that's used in a television studio and a broadcast television studio. That has another set of characteristics. And so even though you can interchange these mixers to a certain degree, uh, it's always best to determine what your function is is it going to be for reinforcement? Is it going to be for broadcast? Is it going to be for 
uh, sound mastering uh, when you determine what mixer you're going to buy. But the basic of mixers is you'll have a bunch of channels, a number of channels with mic inputs, line inputs, and some of them even take uh, other inputs like digital inputs or, or fiber inputs to the mixer. And these are all fed into the back of your mixer. And each channel has an input, like input one is mic one, input two is mic two, input three is mic three, and so on. And you go on down the road in, on the, the row of your inputs, and then you, one of them might be CD roll-in, uh, remote video roll-in, which, which has audio, an audio component, uh, feed from network, a feed from telephone, or whatever. All these are feeding into your mixer. But let's take a look at one channel. One channel is going to have a slider pot, and it, it, it slides you know, up or down. And when you have it all the way down or all the way toward you, then the audio is cut off for that. And then you'll actually take a look at the pot when you slide it up, and the audio will get higher and higher. There's also something at the very top of your mic channel called a trim pot. And a trim pot is what you use to adjust the actual overall gain for that channel. And so let's just go up the, the, the actual row, or up from the bottom to the top of your individual mic channel. You got, you've got your slider pot. Above that, you'll have a mute button. The mute button turns that channel off or on. Now the other button there would be the, the pan pot. Now pan control would assign the output of that channel to either the right or the left or some midpoint in between. Let's say you're, you're actually uh, miking a symphony hall and you have mics all over the orchestra and you have say uh, a mic near the drums, okay? When you go to set the pan pot for the mic for the drums, that position of that pan pot should sort of relate to, it should relate to the position of the drums from the right to the left. And so if the drums are on the left, you want to put your pan pot to the left. And so you have some horns over to the right and you have a mic by your horns. The pan pot would go to the right. And so basically you're reinstituting the, the audio position of your microphones into your audio circuitry so that when the listener is listening in stereo, then the relationship of all the things that are in the symphony orchestra, all the instruments that are in the symphony orchestra are in the same relationship that a normal person sitting in the front row would hear. So when something comes from the left, you would hear it on the left. When something comes on the right, you would hear it on the right. Now that is a rule that sort of revolves around stereo production. You don't have to follow it. Lots of people don't. But in general, you want to use your pan pot to reinstitute the stereo positioning of whatever you're mixing. Now, lots of times people take a lot of, um, of uh, work with those pan pots, and they'll, they'll actually greatly accentuate them so you have a lot more stereo separation. They'll actually put them all in the middle so the program's all pure monophonic. But the pan pot is basically de what determines the position right or left of your uh, mic when you actually play it back in reproduction or reinforcement or uh, you know, if you're mastering and you decide you want to put the drums over here, that's where you put them. But you don't have to follow that. A lot of audio people don't believe in that and they'll just uh, put it wherever they mix it where it sounds best. You listen to the early, early Beatles recording and they would have very hard separation of the right and left channel and you'd have the vocal on the far right and the drums over on the far left and that was something they decided to do something sort of avant-garde at that time and that was a typical early Beatles recording uh, there's a lot of engineers that say we're just going to mix it all audio and play safe uh, there's also some uh, engineers that when they're recording a live event they'll do something like mono compatible microphones well, they put one set of microphones in the middle of the, of the, of the uh, room or in the middle of where it's going to be picking up the orchestra or whatever. And they will to, to have mono compatibility where people listening on a mono receiver would hear, just, hear good sound as well as people listening in stereo. 
they have the two mics and they cross them. The mic on the left faces right, the mic on the right faces left, and and then that allows uh, the feed to be both compatible in stereo and mono. Uh, there's an issue when you when you actually take signals and you combine them back into mono. Like if you're, you're you hear something great in stereo, it's absolutely beautiful. It's got a lot of separation, but then when you combine it back into mono, it has cancellation, and so the phase is out from the right to the left, and when the phase is out from right to left, when you combine the signals back again together, what it does is cancels, and you can actually have a situation where you hear a beautiful stereo, and someone listens on a mono uh, monitor, stereo, a mono radio or something, and nothing's there. You can actually do it, if you want to, to a point where people can hear in stereo, but they can't hear the mono signal. It goes to nothing because you have direct cancellation. So that's important. So that, that's sort of the little topics on the, on the pan pot.